Mental illness is a complex topic. My next guest lived in a true nightmare. She's written a book called Brain on Fire, My Month of Madness. And I want to expand our discussion about so-called mental illness to include the neurobiological and medical realm. Welcome, Susanna Cahalan. Susanna, tell us the story. What happened? Give, give me the sort of the 30,000-foot the overview, and then let's get down into where it started. All right. So in, in 2009, I, I was a reporter for the New York Post, and I had kind of strange behaviors. I started becoming psychotic, and I started to hallucinate. And ultimately, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder um, where my immune system was attacking my brain. All right. Now, so when you say psychotic, I'm going to try to break this down for people at home. A psychosis means it's a particular syndrome where people hear voices or they have delusions and they're really disconnected, hallucinations, and they're disconnected from reality. You, I actually read a little bit of some of the hallucinations you were having. You had a hallucination, for instance, where you thought your dad was an imposter. He was trying, he was yes. actually, it was somebody else dressed up as your dad. Yes, I actually, I believe that he was turning into people to play tricks on me. <laughs> and I also believe that I could age people with my mind, which sounds so bizarre saying it now. But I believe if I looked at someone, I can actually make them grow older. I'm going to ask you please not to look at me. Anyway, um, did, you, did you have, we've been talking a lot about violence in recent weeks. Did you have any violent tendencies? Yes, actually, I, I, was, I was very violent, especially when I was in the hospital, especially towards the nursing staff. I actually kicked and punched them, and I tried to escape. I, I was very violent at that time as well. Where did it start? Give us the, how this started unfolding. You know, you know, it started so subtly. You know, it started kind of, I just didn't feel like myself. You know, I felt off one day, and I mean, everyone feels off one day. And, you know, I thought um, my boyfriend was cheating on me. I was convinced of it, so I actually ripped through his things in search of this kind of imaginary evidence, and I didn't find it. Um, but, you know, other kind of strange kind of paranoia, paranoid thoughts started to emerge, you know, and, and I kind of believed that, you know, I was bad at my job, I became lethargic, I became withdrawn, mm. so kind of small things, but I just thought, you know, I'm having a bad month at mm. that time. And then did you see doctors at that point? Yes, you know, the first doctor I saw thought I had mono because mm -hmm. I had some, I was very tired mm -hmm. and I had a little bit of numbness on the left side of my body. And so he thought it was mono. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, oh, okay, I have mono. I'm 24, I have mono. Um, and then, you know, as this, you know, the disease progressed, I became more and more psychotic and paranoid. And, um, you know, at, at, I became unable to do my job. At work. I, didn't you have a, a very, very vivid experience being, I think, driven to the hospital or something? Is, is there a, a story yes. there? Yes. Yes. You know, on the way to the hospital, um, further along in the illness, I actually tried to jump out of a car, moving car to escape. You know, I thought that, that basically I believed that my parents were kind of taking me against my will. And I, I wanted to get out and ending any means possible. I wanted to get out of that car. Let me, let me ask you something, because we've been talking a lot in these, my program recently about making people get treatment. Even though you didn't want to go, and if you had gone and hired an attorney to protect your rights, think how ill-served you would have been by that kind of intervention. Oh, yeah. Uh, what do you we know, actually, my parents... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah my, my parents actually got a power of attorney over me mm. when I was in the hospital. Because um, they knew, because I kept, I, you know, I, I was coming in and out of lucid moments. And, you know, even during my psychosis, sometimes I could be very lucid in my psychosis. And I, sa I, could, I said to several doctors, I can sign myself out. You can't keep me against my will. Right. And so my mom, you know, was like, I need to do something. So she got a power of attorney. And, you know, during one of my less lucid moments, she actually had me sign it. Wow. When did things finally yeah. turn around? Now, now, I want to tell you, I, I would have noticed something very, very early, which is this, this idea that a, a really classic psychosis of organic psychosis, meaning it's not schizophrenic, mm -hmm. it's not a psychiatric disturbance, it's a medical neurological syndrome, is feeling that people that are close to you are imposters. That's a classic mm -hmm. organic psychosis symptom. So when you started talking about your dad being an imposter, why didn't they look harder for a medical explanation for this? You know, I don't know. I mean, that's called Capgrass syndrome, right? I mean, I think that's what it's, what it's called. And, you know, it's, there were other signs, too. I had a seizure. I had several seizures. And, you know, I had a kind of increased heart rate. So there were all these kind of, you know, these signs, these physical signs that typically do not go with a psychiatric condition. But in the hospital, one of the diagnoses I was given was actually schizoaffective disorder, oh. which is basically, you know, a combination of thought, 
yeah. disorder like schizophrenia and mood disorder like like bipolar disorder. And it's sort of more in the pers character logic realm even. So when did things turn around? You finally had a doctor who who made the right call. How'd that go down? Well, um, he came in and um, Dr. Suhel Najjar at NYU. I'd been in the hospital for about three weeks at that point. And uh, I was getting worse and worse. So I was sliding from psychosis and hallucination and kind of, you know, violence to catatonia. So I became withdrawn. I mean, no emotional register. Mm. I could hardly speak. Uh, I couldn't read or write. And at that point, he asked me to draw a clock, and which is a very bizarre thing to ask a 24-year-old because it's typically a test given to Alzheimer's and stroke patients. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he gave me a piece of paper and he asked me to draw, you know, draw a clock. And so I drew a circle and the numbers I drew in all on the right side. So the, so the, all, the the all the numbers were crunched leg. into the crunch. There was a left-sided neglect and all the numbers were crunched yes. into the, the left side. Yeah, which is, exactly. which is the right side of your brain is not working. It's shut off. That's when they knew there was a problem. It, they knew at that point that it was a neurological problem and not a psychiatric one. That was the kind of the clue. They didn't know what was causing my brain to kind of malfunction in that way, but they knew, okay, this is not psychiatric at this point. And then you started treatment for this autoimmune disorder, and how soon before you cleared? So after that, they did a brain biopsy and they did a spinal tap. Mm. And ultimately, they diagnosed me with, with what's called anti-NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis, which is very hard to say. But... Um, they started treating me almost immediately with um, very, very high doses of steroids, which kind of suppress the immune system, and uh, immune therapies call, uh, such as uh, IVIG and plasmapheresis, right. which kind of flush out these bad, you know, immune cells. And once body. you and once you started clearing, what, what did what did you think about what had happened to you? What's your sort of insight looking back? Well, you know, a lot of that time I don't remember because the part of my part of the you know, one of the parts of my brain affected was the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. so no and memory. that means, I, you know, it's a waylay station for yeah. long-term memories, yeah. you know. So I don't, I don't have the ability to, you but, know, I didn't have you, the ability to make memories then. But you must have cleared and started hearing stories and looked back. I mean, how, how did you make sense of all this and when did you start feeling yourself again? Gosh, you know, I mean, I wanted to kind of turn my back on that time as much as possible. So I'd say about, it took about six, seven months first of all, for me to feel any sort of normalcy again and to return to work. But then that six, seven months, I actually wanted to start learning about what had happened to me. I became kind of open to hearing those stories, whereas before, I didn't want to hear about it. And are you completely normal now? Everything cleared completely? You know, it's such a hard question to answer because it's so hard to be objective, you know, an objective judge of yourself. And, you know, I think, well, six months from now, will I say, oh, well, I, I still had some more to go, you mm. know, some some more recovery to make, but I feel great. And um, you're not hallucinating. You know, I'm not, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, do you think you're on TV or something like that? Is that a possibility? You're, I, no, no gosh. You're, you're connected to reality. Well, that's good. And do you have yeah. to take any psychotropic medication or is it all just the immune suppressions? No, I, I'm, I'm done with all my medication. I'm right. not on any medication right now. Well, Susanna, thank you for sharing the story. I, I really do appreciate it. The book is called Brain on Fire. It's a fascinating story. And if you really, um, the complexities of these problems of what goes on above our neck are just really nicely explored in that book. Thank you.